Hello, everyone. It is Wednesday, October 13th, 2021. Uh, I'm your I'm Chris Caligari. I'm the host of uh, Audio Issues. Oh, hello. I can hear you just fine. Still. <laughs> Well, anyway, um, welcome to the weekly uh, community meeting for Project Foodvert. And uh, this is your chance to um, talk to the project, uh, core developers and, uh, and other users about uh, user issues and, uh, and uh, bugs or new features, anything you want. Um, I'm gonna post our meeting notes into chat. If you could please fill in your attendance um, that is tracked, and we appreciate that. Um, okay. And I will also share my screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, David, were you uh, filling in that first agenda item? Yeah, sorry. I was trying to find my unmute button. <clears throat> no problem. I was just having trouble with the camera button. All right. Uh, go ahead. Sure. Let me. So many windows open. Okay, so I am trying to improve the uh, debugability of uh, virtual machines and the relationship between virtual machines and all the underlying objects. So uh, when a virtual machine is created, uh, it's often associated, well, it's always associated when, once we started a virtual machine with a VMI and then an underlying pod, but then there's also other things that are associated with the virtual machine, like data volumes, which handle the import of disks on the PVCs or cloning of uh, disks on the PVCs. And uh, we might even have more objects in the future. Uh, so when we are looking at what's going wrong with the virtual machine, we kind of have this one-to-one -one relationship with lots of objects underneath it, um, sometimes one-to-many, depending on what it is. Um, and it can't always be obvious, like, what has occurred and if it's bad or, or why we're in a certain state. Uh, it's been improved quite a bit with the introduction of this new printable status uh, feature that, that gives like a high level aggregated understanding of the current status of a virtual machine. But when we want to look at detailed information, we, we still have to look at the underlying objects and that can be drilling through a couple of layers to actually get to the um, problem. Can you guys hear me? Because I, I'm just seeing that it says my connection's unstable. I hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to verify. So, for instance, if we create a virtual machine today and try to start it, and there's not enough resources for it or something like that, uh, we have to drill in uh, several layers to understand why the scheduling problem has occurred. Uh, what I'd like to do is begin uh, aggregating conditions from the VMI onto the VM. And we've kind of handpicked a few so far uh, that actually exist today. So for example, if you pause your virtual machine, uh, we're actually getting a condition on the VMI that, the, uh, that, that live instance has been paused and we're syncing that back to the virtual machine. I'm proposing that we just do that with all uh, aggregate like all conditions. So we have that debug information on the top level object, which is the virtual machine. Uh, so first off, uh, how do people feel about that? And then if we can move past that, I have a, a more detailed question to ask. So basically the plan is to provide uh, all the information inside the, VM, the virtual machine object? It would be a superset. So it would be a superset of the VMI's conditions along with VM-specific conditions. That's my thought process right now. Uh, okay, cool. 
Can you hear me? I can. Okay, okay great. Great. My, great. My volume was auto adjusting before. Uh, I think, yeah, we, we were thinking about things like this for a pretty long time on how to make it better viewable on the VM. And I think we really need to do something there. And this is probably one thing we can do pretty easily and with a good impact on the usability. Cool. Any other thoughts before I ask my more difficult question? Race, like between, <clears throat> will it happen automatically? Um, I, I'm trying to understand what if the, the condition on the VMI will, will change rapidly? Uh, how fast will we update it on the VM? Uh, as fast as the informer tells us of those changes and the VM is reconciled. So it's just okay. in the normal VM update status. We just sync. Oh, cool. Okay. Okay. Here's, here's my hard question. Um, we have a condition on the virtual machine today. Um, I think it's just called failure or something like that. And I think that's inaccurate because we don't really have failures. We have uh, conditions that represent a, uh, an error state that's eventually consistent. So a failure seems permanent uh, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, so that probably needs to be renamed. But what that condition is doing is it's detecting if there was any sort of error that occurred during our reconcile of a virtual machine. It's setting this failure condition. Um, so it's similar in many aspects to the VMI's synchronized condition. So that represents if anything occurred during the reconcile. Now, when I'm looking at merging or syncing um, the virtual machine conditions onto the VM, we have this one set of conditions that are kind of complicated for us because the synchronized condition on the VMI is specific to the VMI controller. And this failure condition on the uh, virtual machine is specific to the exact same thing, but on the virtual machine controller. And I'm uncertain. First, I think that the condition called failure needs to be called uh, because that's really what it's doing. It's saying if there was a synchronization error or if synchronization has passed. And second, if we look at syncing or kind of merging these together, uh, what am I representing with that specific condition? Because it's, it's trying to uh, represent the state of two controllers at mm -hmm. the same time. Yeah, also I, think I have some thoughts, but I'm interested. I, uh, yeah, I want to hear yeah. everyone else's thoughts before I throw out my own. The the sync condition also doesn't seem to be such a, a good name for the VM, uh, for a condition on the VM, because the sync condition is very specific to synchronization between Vert Handler and QE Mobile, the Vert with Launcher. So if synchronized on the VM, would then also maybe compete with other things like I can't reach the node, so I'm not sure if this is the I right considered it, thing. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. It was synchronized. Yeah, I didn't realize that uh, we were considering the relationship uh, to the node. I was thinking yeah. that synchronized was the relationship of how uh, is this virtual machine instance uh, being reconciled successfully. Yeah, it's basically if Vert Handler can reconcile it successfully, that's probably the thing. Is it though? I, I thought that yeah. it was also Vert Controller. I mean, I can look real quick. Maybe, maybe, maybe I remember it wrong. At least initially, initially it was. Or maybe it's just because it normally reveals issues with the Vert and Kivimo, which we have. <laughs> um, uh, I also wonder if. I mean, conditions are very technical also. So like they are also supposed compared to the printable status, conditions are very tech, uh, technical and can be used by other controllers or other processes to, to identify what's going on and if it can or should do something. 
So I wonder if it's really the best thing to 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 move the to synchronize the conditions into the same struct in VMs. That's my main concern. That's interesting. So you're saying that we would separate the two by having a VM conditions and like a VMI conditions? Maybe. On the maybe. status? Just uh, could, could be a possibility, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I like it either, but, yeah. but uh, I feel I'm also not feeling 100% comfortable less with watching. about that. <laughs> hmm. Give me a second. Yeah, so we, we do set the synchronized uh, condition at the cluster level on the VMI. <clears throat> um, hmm. So here is my thought, and I'll throw it out there. I th think that there should be a precedent, uh, not precedence, a uh, priority given to the synchronized uh, condition on the VM, where if a synchronization error occurs at the VM layer, that it is uh, set as the VM's condition, and if there happens to be both a VM and a VMI synchronized error, that the VM takes precedence over the VMI. And if there's no VM synchronized condition or whatever, uh, or it's not set to false, um, that uh, will take one that's set to true uh, or the other way around. Uh, basically, if an error occurs, we'll take the VMI one and display that in the VM. Does that make sense? The priority? I don't know. Now I like my suggestions to have them split more. <laughs> well, the problem with the split is that uh, it's really common. My understanding is it's really common to have a status dot conditions structure that represents all the conditions. So we already have presumably, for example, um, somebody who's building UI components on top of Qvert or other uh, components uh, would be looking at that. So it's the integration point that I'm more worried about. Yeah, it's just not so easy to see them from where something is coming. Not that it's easy now, it's not at all transparent right now, but it's then still not easy to exactly see where something is coming from. Especially if we have maybe similar named conditions, which have which where one would have prefer a precedence over the other. This is the only one. Uh, the synchronized and failure condition are the only ones that overlap. For as long as we're ensured that there will not be more. It's probably fine for me. I don't foresee there being more because, uh, I mean, I could always be wrong here, <laughs> but uh, there's a certain level of responsibility that the virtual machine controller has and a certain level of responsibility that the VMI controller has. And uh, the only thing that's similar today is that both of them are trying to reconcile these objects and report errors when reconciliation yeah. fails. Yeah, so maybe it's good. So the question is, do we try to synchronize these two uh, conditions? Uh, I'm using the word synchronize too often here. Uh, do we try to unify, here we go, those two conditions or um, do we try to keep them distinctly different? Uh, what do we feel comfortable with? I, I think that I'd feel comfortable with the precedence of uh, setting a priority on the VM controller without causing any problems. So one usage model that I've seen, uh, I, I've recently been doing some of the work on uh, getting Argo CD to understand these particular uh, resources and their conditions. Uh, one useful thing is 
whether you are in an unknown state or if you are in a known bad state and you know user intervention is required. Those are, those are kind of two different things because one of them requires an admin to come in and do something. That's really hard to say when user intervention is required. Uh, I'm not sure how to make that judgment call. So what we're doing in that area is we are copying the pod conditions over. So whatever the pod does to indicate that it's in an unknown state and the conditions, you see that in the VMI too. And you would then now see it in the VM if we do the unification. Um, to be honest, I would have to look up what exactly that means, but there are some things which indicate that. Uh, yeah. I have to look it up. Can't find it now. But I think more than just indicating that you lost node. Yeah, the only, I mean, we have to sync. The sync error is basically always a good, the sync condition or the failure condition on the VM is a good sign of that. We do not really know what's going on. Something which may resolve itself is happening, but we have no clear idea what it is. Um, the other thing is when nodes time out and we have what we do there, but I said, I think we do something there. Not sure if that is helpful. Yeah, I think that is actually because the, it does point out that the unknown condition could go either way, right? You, you see, you know, sometimes you'll see a pod in like a, a back off and you're, you know, you have to go and fix something with a registry or with an image tag or something like that. Or maybe you just had a network problem and it will resolve itself. So those are kind of hard yep. to judge. Exactly, yes. Yeah, I think David's proposal is also good for your Argo CD case, where I think we had the issue that one thing you would want to display would you would have wanted to display for VMs uh, was only visible on the VMI, but you didn't have the possibility at the car at, at the position where the state is calculated to do to get that information from other objects, right? Right. Uh, so essentially, putting both objects in, you at least in the the overall synchronization path, it shows when something is still progressing. Yeah, I guess I would feel good combining the conditions to make things like this easier. And to close this out, combining the synchronized condition. Uh, I wonder, uh, I'm not sure, sure I feel good about removing it. I would consider having both with the same content even just for backward compatibility for, yeah. Both with the same content. What do you mean by that? Are you talking about merging them as in taking the reasons and uh, messages and like appending so them? So if I another, still, if I understand you, so do you correct before it's like the failure condition is fed by the sync condition? No, the oh, no. failure okay. condition is uh, the equivalent of the virtual machines synchronized condition. And the VMI- uh, Okay, just the equivalent, okay. There, it really is, and it's just kind of- I agree with you that the, the, the naming is very unfortunate. Yes. For the reasons you mentioned, but still, uh, I think we would at least lead a backward compatible transition path if we decide to remove one of it. Really? Um, hmm. I personally consider it an API breakage if we remove a condition. Is it? Right, so we consider conditions naming part of our API. Yes. So, so the conditions in contrast, for instance, for the content of the printable status 
are something which other controllers and APIs can take into account for their decisions explicitly. It's basically our sta API stable is kpatch, which allows us to express substates of our entities without having to introduce state machine changes. That's why we don't change the phases anymore because we have the conditions for all these substates so that other systems can react to that on this, this sub information. Does that make sure. sense for you? Yeah, it makes sense. Um, I never considered it a stable interface. As yeah, much as an informative interface. So, I mean, you cannot use conditions, their readiness conditions and whatever, and they're considered by controllers to see if something is ready or not. And this is essential. I mean, I don't know about the whole Kubert ecosystem and if it's if this specific condition is really relevant to anyone, that's probably a different question, but in general, that's how it is. I see some conditions being uh, an interface uh, to larger ecosystem, like readiness and stuff like that, yeah. uh, being a uh, consistent. Some of these um, workload specific conditions, like they're specific to virtual machines, like for example, paused or something like that. I guess we have built a, um, an interface for that because people are looking at that to determine yeah, yeah the only way to determine if your virtual machine has been paused or not okay you're right yeah huh so i guess i'm stuck with the virtual machine failure condition today and uh maybe this is a non-issue uh, because i will <laughs> At least if it's I not called failed condition. It's called failure like condition, right? Uh, is it failure or failed condition? <laughs> really easy to check. Yeah, it is. It's yeah, it's failure. Okay, it's not as bad as failed, but yeah, it could be better. You're right. Hmm. Okay. I think I'm going to take everything as it is today and merge it onto the VM and leave the failure condition as it is because it's a, uh, it's a programmable interface that we need to maintain support for. And the discussion of changing that name in the future would be, uh, a different discussion entirely. So we'll have failure to represent the virtual machine um, state kind of, like whether it's being reconciled or not. The synchronization will represent uh, the runtime. So the uh, virtual machine instance uh, ability to reconcile and then everything else is pretty self-explanatory. Does that yeah. uh, sound like a path forward? For me, okay. yes. All right, that works for me. I will clean up this failure condition a little bit because uh, it has some inconsistencies in it, but I'll do that in the PR. Um, anything else on this topic before I move on? Thanks for, sorry, I, I think I took way too much time on it. Oh, that, that's important. okay. I've been uh, taking a look over at the agenda to see if anybody filled anything else in. So no one has, and I just let you run. Okay. That is it for me. Thank you. Thanks, David. Okay, um, since there's no other agenda items, um, let's move on to open floor, which I have the first bullet point to talk about events. Um, just as a reminder, um, David and I will be doing uh, an office hours session at KubeCon NA um, tomorrow, uh, Thursday, October 14th at 1.30 p.m. Pacific time zone. KubeCon NA is in Seattle, so time zones are in Pacific time zone. And I am bummed because the con is, the conference is uh, 
a half an hour drive north of me and it's too risky for me to attend in person. So I get to do it virtual, get to do it virtual. Um, another event coming up, uh, All Things Open 2021 in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, this is a, a major Red Hat sponsored event uh, that they've been doing for quite a while now. Um, we are due to present um, Kubernetes and Kubert on Raspberry Pi and it's going horribly. <laughs> so I don't know what to do here. Uh, uh, if anybody here uh, is interested in, uh, in helping us debug, um, I'm, I'm gonna leave the Zoom session open after this meeting so we can, uh, we can all hack on it. Um, I was hacking on it all afternoon yesterday and uh, actually was able to get a hold of Howard from ARM. And he, he gave me some tips. Um, he did confirm that Kubert is uh, working fully on, on ARM and, and Raspberry Pi. Um, and then he gave me some tips to, to debug. But it was late in the evening yesterday and it was family time. So I haven't had a chance to go through it yet. Um, community, uh, community incubation process. Uh, Roman and I did a presentation on Kubert architecture and uh, community health last week uh, for the CNCF TOC. And I'm not sure how Roman feels, but I feel like it went really well. <laughs> yeah, I have the same feeling. I was pretty happy that it went so well. <laughs> yeah, uh, we have also got uh, really good feedback from the CNCF uh, that they felt that um, we really represented the community well. Um, we're moving on to the next step, which is uh, interviewing of, uh, of three major users of the project. And um, I, I just automatically volunteered Ryan because he's my favorite guy to pick on <laughs> with uh, Ryan with NVIDIA. And uh, that process is either started or completed, um, not sure. He did ping me in Slack uh, asking me um, what the, the format of that session was gonna be. Um, but if anybody has a, a partner in mind or, uh, or another major user in mind that could, um, that would be interested in uh, being interviewed um, on their use of the project, please let me know uh, so I can pass it on to uh, the TOC. Um, so that is all I have from a community uh, standpoint. Chris. Uh, Chris, can you please elaborate uh, what, is the, what is the incubation, incubation process and wh why do we need it? So um, the the CNCF has, uh, they, they groom projects between sandbox incubation and uh, fully endorsed uh, projects. Uh, this is uh, in main, within the Kubernetes ecosystem. So if, uh, if you go over to CNCF projects, Okay, we see a, a myriad of, of applications under uh, operating under Kubernetes. And, uh, and many of these projects compete with each other. And, uh, and so what this, uh, what this entails is uh, like a, a meritocracy of projects that float up to the top of, uh, of the ecosystem and, and get uh, advertised heavily for production use. Um, and that's and so they're they're really encouraging competition and uh, and the best uh, the best project to to fill a space in the in the ecosystem. Uh, Kubert is currently a sandbox project, so we're we're down here in the in the bleeding edge, and we are trying to get into the middle. And once we get uh, become a, a graduated uh, project, um, things move much slower. Um, 
changes are scrutinized uh, heavier. Um, and so that, that's when we start seeing us uh, become uh, productized in vendors' products, which we, we kind of already are in, in several vendors. We, we advertise on our website who's, who's distributing us. So uh, Red Hat does sponsor the project. So uh, this is in alphabetical order, so <laughs> uh, but Red Hat does sponsor us uh, and we, uh, but we don't uh, favor one project versus the other. Uh, Suze and, 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 uh, and uh, Equinix and H3C, Platform 9, Kubernetes, uh, and there's several others that we haven't got authorized to advertise. Yeah, and, uh, there's uh, there's many benefits to uh, to uh, progressing in the in the process. Um, the CNCF uh, um, will um, will step in and give us money for uh, for hardware for marketing. Um, give us hands on uh, assistance with um, with various aspects of the project. Um, as a sandbox project, they just pretty much uh, let us uh, run amok and <laughs> we manage ourselves. Maybe you mentioned it already, but we also get yeah, also incubation projects, integrated projects have more speaking time times on conferences and so on. But maybe you right. said that already. Yeah, yeah, definitely that too. We uh, it would be great to see a, a Kubert become a have a keynote. Yeah, and I think there are really people in the ecosystem waiting for projects to grow, to go up on that ladder to be considered ready to be used. So I think it's pretty important. Well, thank you for the explanation for the elaboration. Thanks. Welcome. Okay, that takes us to. Uh, Itamar has a pull request he would like to talk about. Um, lab migration policies. Hi, can you hear Oops. me? Uh, Itamar, your volume is uh, very low. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me now? A little loud now. Okay. Is it okay now? Much better. Okay, sorry for not putting the link there. For some reason, I couldn't paste uh, into no, the document. No problem, uh, I, I got you covered. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> so this is again the live migrations uh, PR. Um, so basically we, um, we agree that we will have a, an initial implementation at this point, like a POC, in order to have something working, um, something basic. Um, so the question is, what is basic exactly? And, and specifically, the question is how to specify uh, the group of VMs on which you want to apply the, the migration policy. Um, so right now, the, the implementation is doing that by namespace. So you have, can have uh, one migration per namespace, and it works on all of the VMs that runs on this um, namespace. Um, so yeah, um, we are having a discussion, um, mainly me and uh, Vladik over there, if it's the right approach of, or if we should uh, switch it to something else, we can use labels, we can use VMI names, there are many different approaches that come into mind. So uh, yeah, you're welcome to jump in the discussion and help us with your uh, ideas. So thank you. Thank you, Edmar, and thank you for uh, linking to the design proposal. Um, the, the TOC was very interested in hearing about how we implemented that process. Thank you. I think we've only got uh, two or three um, features that have gone through that process so far. Okay, thank you for that. And if we have nothing else, um, we're at 7.37. Uh, let's go do uh, 10, 15 minutes of bug scrubbing.
since I don't believe we have done that in the past few weeks. It's been two weeks since we last bug scrubbed. So let's do, uh, let's skip mailing list review and get into bug scrub. Let's look at this very first one here. Well, you looked at this. Okay, I think I posted uh, the wrong URL, but oh. uh, you, can, <laughs> you, know, you can jump. Yeah, you can jump right into the issues section. I think my issue will be the on the top because I just opened oh. it. Okay. Yeah. No problem. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I wanted to bring up this issue uh, here in the forum just for you to keep me honest if I understand uh, correctly. Um, yeah, so this is the... Still not seeing the title. I uh, know it was like... Uh, yeah, just, just a second. It... I will post the correct... Uh, the correct okay. Thing. Yeah, okay, now it's updated in the document. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, we, we have like two uh, gauge metrics, the virt operator ready and the virt controller ready. I just wanted to make sure that these gauge metrics of Prometheus, they, they need to be aligned to the readiness problem. Because currently they are uh, they are decoupled from the uh, from the you know from the handler of the health endpoint. So when, for example, uh, the build operator or build controller is considered unhealthy, we still have this uh, gauge metric set to one. So what you will see is that from from Kubernetes point of view, the pod is unhealthy and you know the leader election will occur, but on the other side in the Prometheus metric, you will see this same pod in a ready state. So just wanted to make sure that this issue is correct. And if it is correct, I would like to fix it because I was thinking on a way to do that. And uh, yeah, so uh, Roman, David, uh, or anyone else who worked before with the metrics, please keep me honest that this is a real issue. Let me just reiterate it. Yeah, I mean, it's not connected the, to the readiness. The ready metric is not connected to readiness probe, and this is weird. This leads to weird situations. I would agree to that, and we should combine it better. Yeah, definitely. Well, okay, cool. So I have assigned it to myself, and uh, I was thinking about the pass forward about it. Perhaps we'll require some, a little bit of refactoring because. Uh, because the handler of health, it's pretty related to some cube factory, which is not that scalable. Uh, I will perhaps change it, and uh, Roman, I will, uh, as soon as I, as I will have a proposed PR, I will uh, assign, I will, I will CC you about it. Sounds great, yeah. But of course, anyone else can also review first. I don't mind. <laughs> ah, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> of course, anyone. Uh, Everyone out. Welcome. Okay, thank you, Igor. Let's do our normal format here. CTL image upload failed. A larger PVC is required. Image 
upload command looks normal to me. PRs open myself otherwise. Six five eight six. Six. I guess I should start putting links right here. I think we had a very similar issue to this one not so long ago. Uh, I don't know if Michael Hendricks or Alexander Welsh handled it. It may be good to put one of them in. I think the background was something like requesting a bigger image or something like this. I can't recall it right now. Tag needs more information. Wait, let me just look. We have more issues like that. Oh. Yeah, let's. Yeah, let, yeah, you already think that actually was. I'm not sure if we need more information. Maybe he knows it. But yeah, that's just a play of like, why not? Uh, I might know something about this. I think this is this is related to the file system overhead bug that we fixed recently. Toes, you want to take a look at this then? Sure, I can. Okay. Great. Okay, hey, thank you. Next bug. Two VMs under the same VLAN cannot ping the same node. Nice networking issue. Something for Petter or Edward, let's say. You can assign it to me, I'll look at it. Great. Sorry, who is that speaking? Edward Haas, at Ed, Dev, I think, or something like this. I think it's E H A. It's E D D E V. Yeah. Oh. E D D. 
Ah, yeah, there you go. It's diff. Yeah, it's diff. Roman, you have you need to get a Mac so you can run Bug Scrub. <laughs> yeah, it actually got even worse now with my lightning docking station. I'm losing devices randomly from time to time, which are on the docking station. Like suddenly is my my wired network gun or my USB devices. <laughs> Sheesh. Okay, per CTO not working on Mac OS. Yeah, speaking about Mac, maybe you want to take that. <laughs> I don't, I really don't. <laughs> the only reason I have a MacBook Pro anyways is because I have bad eyes and, uh, and it's a very expensive x86 laptop to get something even close to the retina display. If yeah, I could put it, Linux on it, I would. If I do, then I'd lose access to like Wi-Fi and a sound card and yeah, I I asked her. Okay, who's who's in charge of the, the Vert CTO client? I asked there now for giving us uh, output with more verbosity. Just this invalid character. I have no clue where this is coming from. Maybe we see more with more verbosity. Hmm. Otherwise, we would need someone with a Mac. I don't mind. You can I'm slide getting... it to me. I can oh, take it. Uh, I will, uh, yeah. That was That's... Igor, right? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, and my name is even weirder, so it's like <laughs> it's like E and P. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> this is Fedora network interface naming. We got you yeah, forever, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kubert repo has so many bugs. I never get to any of the user guide or website bugs. <laughs> the next one sounds interesting. The next one is, uh, yeah, it's easy. Let's oh, just want to. <laughs> Didn't we talk about Zen last week? Now all of a sudden we have a Zen bug. Well, we we don't support Zen. Yeah. So it's, it's, just, <laughs> it's just writing that they have a prototype working. <laughs> Uh, uh oh, this, Libvert somebody, does support Zen. <laughs> well, yeah, it supports lots of things. Uh, Libvert is different. So, <clears throat> what's this type two and type one hypervisor? I, I think it's just an advertisement. I, I mean, there, there's always this discussion whether KVM is a type one or type two. And uh, I mean, from our point of view, it's, uh, it's, it's type one as well, but. Here they're trying to push. Is that referring to the fact that even the the first, even the host operating system you're running on is booted already as kind of a virtual machine and that the actual hypervisor is outside of it? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. I mean, 
whether the first uh, layer um, implements a hypervisor. Uh, and uh, from our point of view, the kernel does that for us. Okay, so what would be a type two? That's just emulation, right? I, I don't, yeah. okay. Who's filing this? So uh, what it looks to me this? like they've done a, this is from ARM. Okay, all right, all right, yeah. So it looks like they, uh, they've they already done some uh, proof of concept work here. We've been pretty, and they want to add the feature. We've said that we are a KVM project from the beginning. Uh, this is kind of tough. Yeah, it's tough to say there. Um, it's definitely not something, not, not like other features where they say, yeah, I should just add them. <laughs> it's like completely out of scope. <laughs> I, I want to understand why. Like what, what feature support or what, what do they get with Zen that they are not game with the KVM? I can tell you from my, uh, my work history at Credit Suisse Bank, they were a 100% uh, Zen um, shop in 2010. <laughs> uh, they wouldn't entertain uh, any other uh, virtualization for Linux. Um, and Why? that was, be oh, you're getting we were dealing with uh, enterprise that large. Um, they have these, uh, they have support contracts and their main support contract was with Microsoft and they got a, uh, they got free support with, with from Zen, so they made us all, they made us use uh, Zen products, hmm. and there's a lot of them aside um, just a virtualization yeah. product. I, I would say this is a little bit too big to be scrapped here in this meeting. Yeah, um, uh, let me just put a note here to uh, have them submit a design proposal. And at least I'm yeah. making some use yeah. cases. I think mailing should, list. Yeah, they should go to the mailing list. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And say Keep what it they want to do. Mm. Yeah. I don't want to not have to. Yeah, go on. Well, uh, you, you're probably going to say the same thing. Sorry for stomping on you. I don't want anyone to invest a lot of time into any of this uh, without just a really high level discussion. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, that takes us to 7.56 a.m. Um, and we've got uh, a handful of bugs uh, discussed here. And um, how about we call it quits for the, for the week? And, uh, and we pick up the rest of the bugs and next week. Yeah. Thank good. you, Chris. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, have a good week and uh, please help me with uh, these demos if you have time in the next few days. I'm begging yeah, you. <laughs> the, the Raspberry Pi is just a little bit ambitious. <laughs> yeah, sure if if kind of Roman, <laughs> it can be done. It can be done. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, I'm see gonna, you. Bye. I'm going to turn off the meeting now. <laughs> no, I'll restart it in five minutes. <laughs> bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.